Good evening and welcome to Chicago Founder Stories here at 1871, Chicago's digital startup hub. Uh, we have a great founder with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming Greg Kaplan, the founder of Redbox. Greg, welcome. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> so normally we start at Founder Stories by explaining to people, especially the B2B guys, I always end up in this, uh, tell me what you do. You know, Jay Shikawit sold his company for a billion dollars, but most people had never used it because it was a B2B company. I think most people have probably used your, uh, your great innovation, but for those who maybe haven't, or uh, what, what is Redbox, and how would you describe the Redbox business as it evolved? Sure, and I, I love that because uh, when we first started out, it spent about five years explaining to people what Redbox was. Particularly in Chicago, we weren't even here. Everybody <laughs> say, what is that? So what it is is it's DVD rentals, $4. It used to be a dollar. Price has gone up a little bit uh, a day. New releases out of a red kiosk at the front of Walmart, Walgreens, McDonald's, 7-Eleven, Kroger, pretty much every busy place that you would go. Uh, but it took quite a few years before people figured out that we were out there and that they had heard of us. Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's an incredible thing. It's, it's funny. I've, uh, it's amazing to me what, you know, what it did to the business. And it's a great story. One of the things I really enjoy was, you know, you and I have known each other for a number of years through YPO, but... I hadn't really heard the whole story before, and so what I love is every founder's story is uniquely their own, and uh, yours really is. So um, talk a little bit, you know, um, Jeremy just talked about how he got $5,000 in tickets in the boot, and that motivated him to start. You had a, you're, this had a very different genesis, and we'll get into your earlier story before, which is fascinating, but as you, the idea for Redbox and the sort of genesis of Redbox, just take people back to the context of where that started. Sure. Because I think it's pretty unusual. Yeah, so, so my genesis is very different from Jeremy's in the sense that he had a, uh, a real vision, he had a problem, and he wanted to solve it and has done a great job. It was very, very different for me. I came out of two different startups. I was an early employee at two different ones. Uh, good news is they both went public. They also both uh, hit some hard times in the dot-com crash. And I ended up getting recruited to a place called McDonald's Corporation. Uh, and they were interested, and this was 2001, they were interested in starting new businesses, and I had a passion for consumer businesses. I just didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. And they said, why don't you come in, and we're looking for entrepreneurs to help us start new businesses. It doesn't have to be restaurants. We're looking at lots of different things. Uh, so that was, that was originally how we got to, to Redbox. So this is an interesting thing. I mean, most people don't think of McDonald's, and necessarily maybe, maybe they think of another restaurant business, but... Um, so this is unusual. So talk a little bit about what attracted you there, what got you excited about it, and what was that experience like trying to do a startup within the Golden Arches? Right. So uh, at this point, I'm about five years out of business school, and I have two failed startups to my name. Um, two went public, so that's great, but then they both blew up. <laughs> and I'm thinking, OK, maybe it makes sense to do something a little bit less risky for a short time. So McDonald's felt like a really good option. Although, immediately, I did something risky once I got there. So it, it just goes to show you that if you're an entrepreneur, you sort of keep like getting attracted to flying too close to the sun. Um, but, but so the attraction was they had a CEO at the time named Jack Greenberg who was really interested in doing something much more expansive than restaurants. And he was trying to bring in entrepreneurs to help them do things that were different and innovative. And he said, we've got... A lot of money, we've got broad global reach, we've got thousands of restaurants. This is a great platform to start businesses, and if you do a good job, we'll spin it out and you can run with it. Um, and that's ultimately what happened. So talk a little about <clears throat> this group, because this is you know, not a garage, it's, you know, you're there, yeah. but, um, and I know the, st the story gets very interesting and goes on, but, but start with just kind of, what was the group like? Did people just show up and say, hey, what should we create? Or how, how, did, how did it work in a place like that? Yeah, so there was a project in 2001 uh, at McDonald's, and it was a worldwide sort of innovation project. And it, was, it started with, what is McDonald's good at, and what can we leverage with McDonald's, and how do we take that to other places? Um, and then we triangulate that with, what are broad consumer trends? So, so, what, so take us back to a little bit of that yes. analysis of, yeah. you know, what is, how, would, how, would, how did McDonald's define what it was good at, and were, was, were those the right things? Yeah, so after a very long effort, so I'm compressing like a month or two of effort down to 10 seconds here, but we, we came to the conclusion that McDonald's is great at um, distributed operations, right? So there's 30,000 restaurants around the world mm -hmm. um, that have some loose connection with headquarters. They're mostly franchised, um, but they're really good at standardizing something that up until like Ray Kroc came along wasn't very standardized. 
Okay, so that's something to leverage. Not exactly sure to what to do with it. Um, they're great at, at putting out a global brand, uh, again, on, on something that, that didn't have a brand before McDonald's came along, mm -hmm. burger joints. Uh, and so we, we looked at those kinds of things. And, and they're also, by the way, great at con con creating convenience um, for something that uh, people were looking for convenience. And that helped with the second part of the analysis, which is what are really, really big consumer trends that we want to leverage for long term? One of them is uh, busy consumers being time starved and saying we want to save time. So what are solutions that will help people save time? That was one big one. Another one was consumers using technology in place of people to do everyday tasks. Hmm. Um, and that was a little bit of the spark for what ultimately became Redbox, which is we said, well, if you look at the vending world, um, and this is now going back 13 years, vending for the most part was Doritos and Snickers bars and sure. Coke, but had never become anything bigger than that. With one exception, which was interesting, which was ATMs, uh, which you know, most people don't think about ATMs as vending machines. Well, and right? vending and vending had a bad name for a long time it did. because it was like you know things were like so old. The exactly. expiration dates were in hieroglyphics, kind of. Mm -hmm. It was always the who you'd actually eat that out of the machine. Yep. Um, so that's interesting. So thinking of ATM as, as vending, of course, it is cash vending, but you don't really think of it. That no. Way. So we were looking at the ATM as a really huge success story, and we we're saying there's an opportunity for consumers to do far more with machines. And we started studying ATMs, actually. And, and if anybody has looked into the genesis of ATMs, they started as a way for banks to save money, basically. Because they didn't want to, they looked back and they said, every time somebody comes into a bank and takes out cash, it's like eight or $9 using a, a human teller. But if we do it through an ATM, it's 50 cents. And I'm making up the numbers. But it's something like that. Right. And initially, consumers hated going to ATMs. They totally resisted it. And then something changed. And then they started loving it to the point where even back in 2001, when I was sitting in a room like this and I said, how many people have actually seen a human teller in the last three months? Nobody would raise their hand. So there's this incredible psychology of once people start using a machine, if it works really well, they'll never go back to a human. They just it's love funny. that experience. It's funny. It's very interesting. I, I looked at, the, we went, I went to school in Connecticut when I was young, and I saw my first one out there kind of thing, and it was you know, fairly early. I've never seen it here. ATM you know, red box. ATM. Okay. And all the young people, yeah, I'm saying, <clears throat> all the young, basically all the young guys were like, this is great. Like, right. you know, the, you could see the difference in mindset. Mm -hmm. Like, all the students were like adopted immediately, which kind of, of course, foreshadows what we're in today. The other one that we looked at, by the way, at the time was, and this was just starting to take off, was self-check-in at the airports. And that one was really, really ripe for interesting sort of insights in the sense that consumers also stopped going up to the human because the human could do the same thing that what the, the kiosk could do. It's largely just get my boarding pass and, and pick a seat. Sure. But what we found when we talked to a lot of consumers, they loved the idea of control with the machine. Meaning, yes, you as the person behind the flight counter could pick a seat for me, but I can do a much better job as a consumer deciding whether I want an aisle in the front or a middle seat or, right. or, or exit row. So I want all that control. And machines became a lot about getting control. That's interesting. We see that. We built some technology for BMW USA. And one of the things we find is if you if people were giving iPads to people to go shop. Yep. And we found when we had them use their own phone, they liked it better. Mm -hmm. Screen smaller. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't optimize the device. Yep. And we weren't even, their web apps, you're not even down, you're not even doing native apps because they don't want to download it. But the experience of doing it on their own phone, they trust it more, it gives them that sense of control. It's very interesting to understand the nuance of psychology because it drives adoption so yep. much. Um, interesting, interesting. So um, how did it, like, what was the first, what did the minimum viable product look like in this thing? Yeah, so, so with this set of insights at this point, all we know is, uh, McDonald's wants to put some money into things that will help leverage their core capabilities. We think that there's some broad consumer trends around convenience and machines and not using humans to do things because people don't want to talk to humans, which is so interesting. Um, we said, let's go see if we can find some innovative vending machines that do more than just sell you a, a Diet Coke or something like that. Um, and interestingly, in Europe and Asia, they're far ahead of us in terms of using machines. Sound, well, I'm sure it would have sounded like a joke to certain people. Like, well, we find innovative vending machines. Like, if it was not right. a space. It's interesting because you're hitting a space that looked like a space that was going to go away. Right. You know? So, by the way, that was one of the insights at the time, which is we have to stop using the word vending because it, it just connotes something really negative. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, th I, I think I may have created this new term called automated retail, 
which people would say, well, what's that? And I said, well, it's basically vending, but it sounds a lot cooler. <laughs> um, so we just went with automated retail and that sort of stuck. Oh, and I like it. We ultimately actually named the company Redbox Automated Retail, and people seemed to understand what that meant. I'm going to have to come to you for some catchy brand names. This yeah. is good. Um, so let's, let's go back for a minute to kind of the, because uh, I think there's a great story of kind of from the idea to launch and through, which we'll get back to. But um, kind of, let's let's go back to the, sort of the beginning. You grew up in New York. I did. And uh, out of Long Island. So, talk a little bit about you know what people who knew Greg Kaplan as a kid, and then they saw you again um, with uh, the success you've had. Did people, would people look to go, oh, I knew he'd do something like that, or did they think they think uh, you would have done something different, or what? Yeah, I can't. See, you know, sometimes you read these stories about born serial entrepreneurs that literally when they're six years old are starting businesses out of their garage and stuff like that. And it wasn't me. Uh, I was a good student, um, but, but I wasn't necessarily starting tons of businesses. The, the first time I did anything even remotely entrepreneur, entrepreneurial was at, was at college. Um, and, and I could tell you about that, which was uh, I went to Michigan. And any, any Michigan fans, by the way? There we go. Wow. Um, there's always We're surrounded. Crowd. Yeah, it's a tough year for football, but anyway. Um, and uh, I went to my first football game and uh, said, oh, this is a huge stadium. It's 100,000 fans. And I had seen it at a couple of other stadiums around the country. Believe it or not, they were selling marshmallows. And basically when the game got boring, and Michigan was pretty good back then, so the game would get boring in the second quarter, people, the students would start throwing marshmallows at each other. I remember the marshmallow throwing era. Yeah, there you go. So a friend and I went to Myers in Ann Arbor, and we bought about four pallets of marshmallows um, for, I don't remember how, how much How does one it was. order four pallets of marshmallows at Myers? Uh, we called up the general manager in charge of marshmallows. <laughs> um, and, and we asked for that. He said, he said, why do you want four pallets of marshmallows? He said, forget it. I don't even want to know. Just, um, he, he stopped himself before he finished. Um, so we ended up uh, spending the next six games selling marshmallows for a buck a bag. And I think we bought them at like 12 cents a bag in volume. Um, and the, my first lesson in, in business, because this is my first entrepreneurial thing, is you got to know when to get out. Uh, so at the end of that season, my friend Kevin, who was my partner in this, partner, wasn't that legal, uh, said, let's do it again next season. And uh, I said, you know what? I feel, like, I feel like there's low barriers to entry on this one, right? Um, anybody can go to the marshmallow guy at Myers and be You didn't have this. an exclusive? No, no. <laughs> uh, I said, you know, let's just call it a day. Uh, turns out, right after, uh, right at the beginning of the season, Michigan came out. The athletic department had a big press release, which is, we are barring marshmallows from University of Michigan Stadium. Um, so I said, Kevin, we got out at the right time. <laughs> so there was a whole bunch of other competitors stuck with pallets of marshmallows. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay, so you, you get out of, uh, you graduate from Michigan. What was your major? Philosophy. Uh, <laughs> Where did that come from? Exactly, right? exactly. Uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, I took a philosophy class that seemed really interesting. So it I is stuck. really interesting. It was really interesting. It was a great major, and I stuck with it. You know, Chris Hammond, who's the founder of Narrative Science, he and I used to work, do some uh, work together. And uh, his PhD is in, in philosophy. Mm -hmm. And he's an artificial intelligence guy. And of course, the logic of it kind of fits. But it's not obvious how you make that connection. Um, so you, you get out of your philosophy major, and then um, you don't go the route, though, that um, a lot of our founders, you know, I was, I think three in a row I had mechanical engineers out of MIT. Right. Um, so you're a philosophy major and you go into banking, I think, right? Yeah. So I was thinking about law school. I applied, I got accepted, and then somebody I knew who liked me said, why are you going to law school? And I said, I'm not sure. Uh, and he said, why don't you just go work for a couple of years and defer law school, um, which, by the way, has now turned out to be about a 30-year deferral. <laughs> um, and I, uh, so I, I deferred, and he, I said, well, I don't even know what to do. He said, why don't you try investment banking? Uh, and I said, I have no idea what that is. And he said, they pay you a lot, and you get to fly interesting places. And I said, OK, that sounds interesting. Um, turns out, by the way, my first job at uh, project at investment banking was in Newark, New Jersey. So I was like, oh, what's, with the, what's with the uh, exciting places? <laughs> um, but that's so I went into investment banking in New York. Um, so, that's, uh, so that's interesting. So you go into banking. Um, the Drew Gant um, from uh, uh, Wyzant was my guest last time. And Drew uh, was also an investment banker, but he lasted a week. 
<laughs> his big crisis was, I already spent the $10,000 signing bonus. What do I do now? Fortunately, he learned Uncle Merrill was very, was, uh, very forgiving, but uh, maybe they'll get his IPO to, to pay him back. But, um, so how did you like banking? Were you, uh, were, was it something you really gravitated to? Was it something more like Drew, like, hey, I'll do this, but I, that's not what I want to stick with? Like, how'd you? Uh, it was amazing training ground in terms of understanding. So I had taken, by the end of four years, I had taken not a single business, finance, account, any kind of class. So I had no idea about, about anything in the business world. Um, so investment banking turned out to be an amazing training ground on, on a bunch of different levels. One is just learning about finance, learning about how companies get financed, how they go public, how they're bought and sold, how you model these things, um, all of which was totally new to me. Uh, I think it was also, it was a great training ground um, for a couple of other reasons. Um, one was, uh, as you know, if you're on the low end of the totem pole in investment banking, you're generally working 90 to 100 hours a week. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's a boot camp mentality. And looking back on it, and I don't work anywhere near that now, but I, have, I think I have a level of confidence knowing that if I need to, I know how to do that, and I was right. able to do that. Um, I think there was one last piece, which was totally psychological, which was uh, this. So the investment bank I went to was this boutique in New York, and they only recruited from Harvard. And I went to public school in Michigan. Uh, and so I was fairly intimidated coming in. Uh, because it was, all my colleagues were from Harvard and, and, uh, and purported to be super smart guys. And after I was there for a while, uh, I realized some of them were really smart and really talented. Some of them weren't. And uh, all of a sudden, I said, you know what? I think I, I think I can hold my own with these folks. And it was a total change from being entirely intimidated to saying, all right, maybe I'm OK. Maybe I can uh, do I can, this. I can run with these guys. Well, you know. Uh, uh, if Conan O'Brien has a line, he went to Harvard, and so the pr the curse of going to Harvard is, if you say something dumb, people look at you and go, "And you went to Harvard?" <laughs> so, that's the that's the upside. So you're uh, you get out you you get you get out of investment banking, and you go to Harvard. <laughs> right, right. This is the so that's the end of the story. <laughs> as I ended up calling that. <laughs> um, so you get to Harvard Business School. Yeah. And uh, how was that experience? Uh, amazing. Really a fantastic experience. Uh, for anybody that doesn't know, Harvard practices this case study method, which is you basically every day you go through three or four different business cases for I think it was like 90 minutes each class. And it's, and it's an actual case, which is it could be the, the Nike case or the GE case or the Microsoft case. And since it's Harvard, they end up sometimes getting the protagonist in the case right in yeah, the front right. row. So you end up spending a whole class talking about Dell and then you forgot the fact that Michael Dell is sitting right there in right. front of you as you're opining about what you think Dell should have done. Uh, and he stands up and he says, you're entirely wrong. It's sort what, of what year were you there? I was there in 95 to 97. If you read Jeff Bezos, the book. Um, he was there as well, but I mean, he, he visited a, a class at that same time. And apparently in, in the case, they forgot about him because they, the, the advice was, sell out to Barnes and Noble before they crush you. Right. And he sort of said, well, thanks a lot for your advice, but I think we'll do OK. And they're like, that guy's not going to make it. <laughs> so he visited a class my first year. Uh, totally kooky guy. I don't think anybody walked out of the class saying, this is going to be an icon. It's interesting. Well, uh, you know, Jason Fried from 37 Signals Base Camp has him as an investor. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, you, you can be however quirky you want if you can do what he's done. I mean, yes, yeah, clearly. Incredible. What an incredible story. So you, you get out um, of Harvard Business School. Where do you go then? Yeah, so second year, uh, there was a case in my service management class. And it was on this company called Streamline, which was an online grocer similar to Peapod, which a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, a slightly different model. Uh, it was doing all sorts of different things in addition to groceries. It was unattended delivery. Really liked the model. Uh, so I went up to the CEO, who was the founder. It was a very small company at the time. This was our first semester, and I said, I want to work for you. And he said, I don't have a job for you. And I said, you don't need to pay me. I said, I really like what you're doing. I said, I've got time this next semester before I graduate. Let me spend five, 10 hours a week working for you. And he said, so the pay is like zero? And I said, yeah. He said, OK, you're hired. <laughs> um, you got to drive a good, tough bargain. Yeah. I'm, I'm not a very good negotiator. Uh, so I spent, uh, I spent uh, some time working there. Uh, before I graduated, and I said, this is what I want to do. Uh, so I, I joined, I think, two days after graduation, um, and 
streamline, I, which I can sort of, over the next three years, ended up raising, I think it was about 50 million privately. Interestingly enough, the primary investor was Nordstrom, which is, so it, it just, it turned out that Streamline was accessing the same customer base as, as Nordstrom, and they saw some overlap. And remember, this was sort of the dot-com days, so everybody was investing in everything. Well, I say they're incredibly innovative uh, for a large retailer, and, you know, they, I think the, they've, I think the guys from uh, Trunk Club said, you know, they're really giving them a lot of room to run and innovate, and said, you know, we bought you for a reason, and so they seem like, people who would get it a lot more than you can imagine the big companies yeah. getting it. So, so how'd the company, where'd that company go? What happened to it? Yeah, so uh, in, trying to remember all the dates, in 99, uh, it went public. Uh, I think it was maybe about 10, 15 million of revenue at a time where you could go public with 10 to 15 million of revenue. Wasn't profitable. Uh, it was a facility-based kind of model. So there was a first facility in Boston, and then they built a facility here in Chicago. There was one in DC. Uh, so the, the great news was that we'd gotten a facility profitable, but public, going public, and this was a great first lesson for me, all of a sudden there's demands, which is you have to grow even faster. You're public. Uh, so putting out lots of facilities, which takes lots of cost and capex, and when the market starts to dry up for putting more capital into a business, unless it's profitable, you're in pretty, uh, right. pretty bad shape. So at, right after the company went public, literally a day later, I said to my then uh, wife, uh, it's time to go. And she said, why? And I said, I think the stock is 13, 14 bucks. This is going to be the best it gets uh, because I think we're going to run into some headwinds. The CEO was a really great entrepreneur but was not a guy who could scale the business from 15 million up to 100 million. Uh, I said, so let's, as soon as we can sell, let's sell everything and, and go do something different. And, and that's actually what I did. I sold everything at the lockup, um, which is, um, one of my few really great stock decisions um, <laughs> because the stock, the next two years, the stock went down and down and down and eventually the company went belly up. Got it. Before we go to the next one, let me ask you, there's a question that's been kind of buzzing around tech and venture circles in the last few days. Uh, did you read Bill Gurley's interview in the Wall Street Journal? I tweet, if you're interested, go to my Twitter account. I tweeted it out. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, and then Fred Wilson wrote something today um, on the same topic, this question of burn rates being too high. It's, it's sort of not a value bubble, a valuation bubble, but it's a um, the idea that it's a burn rate bubble. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so that was a huge lesson for me going into Redbox. Um, probably one of the primary lessons, which is um, getting to cash flow break even as a as a company is a huge, huge milestone, and we tried to get there at Redbox as quickly as possible uh, because. If, as long as you're not cash flow positive, you're in this position where you're always begging for cash if you've got to grow. And um, once you become cash flow positive, you're, always, you're, you're now in uh, sort of control of your destiny. And you can always lower your growth rate, but you're not going to go belly up. Okay. So, uh, and, and I do a lot of mentoring today to, uh, to venture back companies. And they say, well, I can get to cash flow positive or I can go much, much faster. And in most circumstances, my opinion is, Try and get yourself to that cash flow positive as soon as you can, because you'll be able to sleep a lot better at night. You know, I think that's, it's not always the right decision, but no. But it's I think it's the ability to control your destiny. I think one thing there was a great um, I tweeted this out the other day. I wish I could. Um, it was uh, it was the guy from uh, I'm not going to remember big New York he's, big New York company the the Shutter Shutterstock, and he talked about um, how when you're burning a lot of cash uh -huh. and you're taking a lot of venture money. Um, it's very hard to control your trajectory. It's sort of, you, you lose, you know, and, and I think people underestimate, like, well, we could get profitable, but when you're, when you're so big and you see companies that start cutting like that, even though if you'd started from the bottom up, you could get it down to 30 people to run and be cash flow positive, going from 60 people to 30 people is so traumatic to the company, and I think people underestimate that. It's actually, you can... You can, in one circumstance where you build it from the bottom up, have a 30-person company that can be cash flow positive doing all kinds of uh, things beyond what looks like their reach. And you can have a similar exact same circumstance in a 60-person company that can't do it at 40 because you just cut too much. It's too traumatic to the people to go through that kind of downside. I totally agree with that. And the other point I'd make is that every time that you're going out for venture financing, 
it is a huge distraction to the company, totally. much, much more than you ever expect. And it never takes the time that you expect it's going to take. It always takes longer. And what ends up happening is that for several years, you're in this start and stop mode. And it's very hard to build momentum. And when you're in a point where you can fund your own growth, you can just go and you can plan ahead. And that makes a huge difference. And for us, we at the time, for Redbox, we had a whole bunch of competitors that nobody here would ever remember because they only lasted a couple of years. Um, but for a while, there were five or six competitors that looked like they were going to be out in front of us. And we were able to raise, and I'm jumping ahead here, but we were able to raise a lot of money and not be in the position of going to raise money every six months. And it allowed us to go much, much faster. Well, so let's go, let's go back to the red box story a little bit. Let's, yeah. let's talk about the funding side of this. So you're, and I, I've, we got a couple different topics we'll cover here, and I apologize the sequence won't be perfect chronological, but we'll do it more by topic. Sure. So, um, so the fundraising. So you, you get to a point at um, where this thing's ready to become a company. Yeah. And in theory, you have you know one of the largest companies in the world as your sponsor. Talk about how that. I know how the theory of it worked, but I know the reality wasn't exactly the same. Talk about right. how that worked and how you navigated that. Share, share that if you will. So a little bit of context. So uh, we, we, we get a little bit of initial funding from McDonald's to go look at innovative vending. Um, we look at several different things um, from Europe and Asia. We test a handful. Uh, one of the ones that works really well is this, these DVD kiosks. Um, and, Out of Italy, right? Uh, Italy and Israel. Um, for whatever reason. So we, we, we shut down everything else, we focus on DVD, and we iterate that until we get the model right. Yeah, I, want, I want to come back to yeah, that yeah. in a little bit, but please. Um, so then, we, 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 in the midst of all of this, it's important to understand the context of what's going on at McDonald's. So Jack Greenberg, who was the guy that originally gave us our start in funding, uh, leaves the company. They bring in an old line McDonald's guy, because the stock had dropped pretty dramatically at McDonald's. So this guy, Jim Cantalupo, who'd been at McDonald's for 30, 40 years, out of retirement, he comes in, and, the, and the, 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 the mandate from the board is focus. Burgers and fries, restaurants, clean the bathrooms, that's For those it. you don't know, um, uh, Jack Greenberg was the one who brought in Chipotle. And they yeah, that's right. Of, they had a bunch of different restaurants. Chipotle, Boston Market, pret a and, and Redbox. So there were a lot of... There was a lot of diversification going the on core in Jack. Was not. The problem was the core was sort of not doing so well. So Jim comes in, and I think it was day two of his, <laughs> of his uh, reign, he shut down like a thousand different projects, including Redbox. Uh, and I go, I, now I sort of had seen a little bit of this coming. So I had reached out to a handful of venture capitalist friends and said, would you be willing to fund us if we spun out? And I got some yeses. So I go into Jim, and I oversell because I'm afraid. Because all I need from him at this point is because he's already shut down Redbox. He's cut off our funding. And that's his mandate from the street is to yeah. get focus on the core business. Yeah, and he doesn't have a clue what Redbox is, by the way. He just saw a list of pages and pages of projects and said, cut, 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 cut. Well, cut. I heard the story at McDonald's at the time. I actually worked with Jack Greenberg. I was a quarter pounder chef, and he was just joined to become the CFO, and they made him work at McDonald's store for six months. Right. And I was there. He went to be CEO, and I never made it to past <laughs> quarter pounders. But, um, but part of the story was it's a classic thing about corporate innovation, right? It's a great <clears> idea <throat> until your core business isn't there. And some analyst did the math and said it would take Chipotle a hundred years to make a difference the way you know getting Europe working better would be. Right. And so this was a really tough. Like the whole world said McDonald's made a mistake by going this way, and right. And so I imagine everything. Yeah, and it's a great lesson, right? Which is. Innovation only works. The street will only allow you to innovate as long as your core business is going well. Right. You got to get both going at the same time, and it wasn't. So, so Jim says, "What is this red box thing?" So I, I explain it to him, and he's looking very bored, not all that interested. And I said, "Listen, Jim, all I need is your permission to take this, to take to, for me to take outside money, and I'll never ask you for anything again. And, and I'm not going to ask you for any money." And he said, "Well, tell me more about this." So that's when I oversold. So he. He, said, he looks at me and he said, Greg, I don't give a shit about DVDs. And, and I'm trying to think, what he, where is he going with this? Uh, and I said, yeah. And he said, but do you think you can, if you put these at McDonald's more and more, he said, do you think you could help me sell more burgers and fries? And the answer was, I didn't have a clue if I could or I couldn't. Um, but of course, I said, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and it's obvious how 
selling DVDs will sell you more burgers. Yes. So he said, how much money do you need? So I said, 10 million? <laughs> um, and he said, OK, you got it. Tell your VCs no. He said, but your whole focus in life is helping me sell more burgers and fries. Um, and so there wasn't really anything, I mean, there, was, there wasn't any other option. Mm -hmm. So we sort of turned on a dime at that point, and, and, and actually we, we did do a whole bunch of things. We, we even changed the return time so that people would be bringing back the DVDs um, during dinner hours, and we did co-promotions with the restaurants, um, and, and all sorts of things to try and drive that. And we, we actually measured same-store sales at the McDonald's that we put the red boxes up at in order to prove this. It wasn't, candidly, it wasn't that we were so interested in in trying to drive McDonald's sales, because that wasn't our real goal in life. But that's what our funder said to do, so that we did it. And how'd it work? It worked great, actually. Uh, at the time, we, we launched an entire McDonald's market, which was Denver. This was 2004. And we were able to show uh, about 5% same-store sales incremental wow. for McDonald's that had red boxes. And if anybody, if you're, you're familiar with the McDonald's system, this is a 50-year-old business. Anytime you can say something like 4 or 5% same store sales growth, it's a big, big deal. So Huge. all of a sudden, we got a lot of traction in the system. Interesting. And they would very sophisticated, I remember, in match stores and knowing what profiles work. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you had some pretty good demographic data, even though it was obviously a narrow focus. Yeah. Um, so that sounds like good news. At least, you know, your funder would be happy. It was good news, bad news. Right. The, the good news was we live to see another day. Right. The bad news was is... Now there's this focus just on McDonald's, and we knew in the back of our minds that uh, in order to really do this right, meaning for Redbox, we needed to go to a lot of other locations, meaning supermarkets we knew were going to work, and we didn't have a mandate from McDonald's to start going out to tons of supermarkets. Um, so we didn't know exactly what to do. And right in the midst of all of this, um, and, and you'll recall this, Jim Cantalupo tragically passed away, and his successor, a guy named Charlie Bell, comes in. And again, by the way, he cuts us. <laughs> and we, we have to go and back and, and sell. And he said, OK, this is fine. And that's when I, and I said to him in a meeting, uh, you know what, Charlie? I don't think you're ever going to support us rolling out red boxes at Kroger's and Safeways and Walmarts. And he said, no, the Wall Street doesn't want us to be <laughs> renting DVDs at Walmart. That's not part of McDonald's mission. And I said, why don't you just allow me to raise money outside you never have to put another dollar in. And I said, but we will continue to support McDonald's and putting red boxes at McDonald's, which will help say, uh, uh, sell more burgers and fries. And he said, that sounds great. And that's coming back to your original question, mm -hmm. what was the fundraising like? So at that point, we did a real, and this is 2005, a real fundraising effort. And I went to both coasts to pretty much every really good, smart VC out there. And the good news is we had McDonald's, so we can get in to see a lot of these folks. Um, and it was my first time CEO gig, so they weren't seeing me because it was me. They were seeing me because it was McDonald's and sure, we'll talk to you. And um, we got turned down pretty much everywhere, um, just to be really frank. Uh, and, and we were looking for a lot of money. We were looking for 25 to 30 million at that time because we knew we needed a lot of capital to grow fast because at this point, the model had been proven. Now it's just about rolling these things out as fast as possible. And most VCs were saying, well, maybe a couple million here and there, but you're not profitable. What was the revenue like? At that point, it was around 20, 25 million. Hmm. Um, and, 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 and they were saying, well, um, it's, that's a lot of money for a VC even today. And it's physical assets, and it's CapEx, and it's kiosks, and that's sort of a bad word in Silicon Valley. So we got turned down by uh, pretty much everybody, certainly for what we were asking. So what do you do? Uh, so we started talking to strategics. And there was a strategic out of Seattle named Coinstar. Uh, which um, you're probably familiar. These are the green machines at the front of most supermarkets where you put in your change and you get back bills. And they were doing their own diversification effort and looking for other things that were going to be in the front of supermarkets. So they sort of found us, and we found them roughly at the same time. And they ultimately said, we'll put in $32 million for 46 47% of the company. Uh, how much did McDonald's own? So, well, it, uh, after this transaction, uh, McDonald's owned 46 as well. Management took a little piece in between. So we sort of had these two public company partners, hmm. um, which was actually, at the time, which was actually pretty good because neither one of them had control and they sort of balanced each other out. And at this point, McDonald's could care less about us because they had their own issues. So mostly we were left alone to just grow the business, which was great. great. So you, you talked about proving out the model. I'd like to go back and dive a little yeah. deeper on that one because 
you know, how many of you have read or are familiar with Lean Startup? <clears throat> you think about Lean Startup. So Lean Startup is a phenomenon of the last five years. So it was talked about in the Valley before. And, you know, I remember my friend John Danner started Net Gravity. He said, you know, you, first, you, first you basically figure out, you know, you talk about the different stages and what you do. But it wasn't a science the way it was, you know, it is now. Um, I, I think it's very interesting, you know, as I listen to your story, you essentially were doing lean startup back before anybody knew what it was called. Talk about two things, if you will. Kind of walk people through that process and how yeah. you did it, and then why? How did you figure this out without um, having a New York Times bestseller available to you? <laughs> so I think the, the going in, so McDonald's view of innovation was what I call a very typical big company view, which is you do market research, and then you do focus groups, and surveys, and quantitative, and qualitative, and et cetera, et cetera. And, and that was the approach. And we immediately said, that doesn't make sense, particularly for us, for a ton of reasons. But, but one of them, which was really practical, which is, at the time, let's say we have 100 or 200 machines out there. Why would we ever spend months and months and months and months trying to get external data in order to try and prove what we could already do in a second by just putting it on a machine? So let me give you an example. Uh, at one point, we said, hey, maybe we should start renting TV series. And if you remember TV series at one point on DVD, so Sopranos and Sex and the City and stuff like that, those were big sellers. Mm -hmm. So should we start? So we could have taken one approach, which is let's do a lot of research on these things. I said, forget that. Who cares? Just buy, literally go to Walmart, buy, buy a couple thousand dollars worth of Sopranos and, and other ones, and stick them in a machine and see what happens. And we'll either learn rather quickly. And, and the truth is, by the way, it didn't work particularly well. Hmm. Uh, for, for lots, of, lots of good reasons. But by the time that we were probably would have been done, just done with the research and starting to implement it in the machine, we had already iterated three or four times and realized this is probably not going to work. And there's a lot of examples of things that did work, and we were able to change them and refine them in the space of time that it would have taken to do all this research. So what would be a, what's an example, is there an example that kind of sticks with you that you think, boy, that was a great lesson. I, I'll, my next company, that's a story I'll share. Yeah, so let me, let me give you an example, not from Redbox, but from a subsequent other business that we created, um, which was many years later. So we were trying to create lots of other kiosk businesses. And uh, we created this uh, kiosk concept, which was uh, buying and selling used gift cards. Um, and there's something, there's a, a website called Plastic Jungle, for example. And we saw this and we said, well, um, that's really interesting. If you have a $100 Walmart gift card that Aunt Tilly gave you and you really don't want it, what do you do with it? And by the way, there's billions of dollars of used gift cards out there that people don't want. And they're sitting in drawers gathering dust. So you can create a market for them. So we said, well, one of the issues with Plastic Jungle is people don't want to send in the mail their gift card into some no name. What if we created a kiosk where on the spot you swipe your gift card and it says, oh, there's $100 on this Walmart gift card. We'll offer you $80 right here on the spot. You can just get it right out of the machine. And then, by the way, we'll go next day, we'll sell it to you for $90 and we make the spread. Okay, so, so, here's the, so how do you go and test this? We could have done lots and lots and lots of market research on this. Or another option is you go and build a machine, but we also know that it takes, sometimes it takes six months to a year to build a good machine. Hmm. So here's what we did, is we took two people that worked for us, we got a six foot table, we went at the front of a, I think it was a Dominix, several Dominix, and we put up a sign that said, buying and selling used gift cards. Um, and that was it. And somebody on the board said, well, how is that going to help you? And I said, the whole key here is learning what consumers are going to do. We know how to manufacture machines. We know how to set up root distribution. We know how to do all those things. But it takes a lot of time and effort. What we need to find out is, will consumers sell us a Walmart gift card for 80 bucks, and will they buy it for 90 bucks? Mm -hmm. So within the space of about two weeks, very, very cheaply, which is the whole point of Lean Startup, and quickly, we had all the information we needed. And by the way, we ended up building that business, and it's now something that's functioning under the Coinstar umbrella. Oh, interesting, interesting. So you go through the iterations. How was, if we looked at the original, sometimes I look at our early products and you kind of, you kind of grimace. You're like, we once thought that was super cool. And then you kind of see where you get. What was the early version of the business or the product or the solution that sort of pre-iteration, how is it different than what we know and love today? Uh, so one, one huge change for us was price. So when we first went out, and all the, the kiosk competitors that were out there, generally went what I'd call with a blockbuster-like price point. So 
three, four, five dollars for three days or something like that. And it worked okay. And I remember the, the meeting, we said, you know what, we need to do something to generate some consumer excitement. And so let's come up with some sort of different model um, that's very, very straightforward, easy to remember, and it's not going to ever make money because it's too low, but we just want to generate traffic and then we'll eventually raise the price. So we came up with, how about a dollar a day? Uh, because everybody was angry with Blockbuster because you never knew exactly when the return time was and if you missed by five minutes, another five dollars. Let's just make it straightforward. It's a dollar a day. Rent it anytime today. When you bring it back tomorrow, uh, it's a dollar before nine and then it's another dollar, but it's totally up to you. Uh, and but we'll never make any money, it's too low, so at some point in the future we'll, we'll raise it. So we put it out there. So did somebody say, hey, I don't think we can make money on a dollar? Yeah, yeah, and you and did it everybody in the industry, including us. We, we didn't think so either, because if you looked at the way that a blockbuster or at the time Hollywood video made money, um, the price point would never work. Right, so, take, so take me back to the room, because I think this is a very, a story that gets more and more interesting. But take me back to the room, because, all right, so we're in the room, I'm part of your management team, and we say, great, let's go do it for a dollar. Someone must have been either saying or thinking, well, why would we test something we know we can't make money on? So how did you guys, how'd that conversation go and how was that decision made? So this was still early in the life cycle. The model was clearly not set. And we knew at $4 for four days or whatever the price point was, it wasn't going to be strong enough to roll out quickly. So we needed to try and do something different and generate the excitement. But it's a, it's a very can-do attitude to say, let's go sell it at a loss. Yeah. Or what we expect to be a loss. Yeah. Um, and it, so, was, it, was, it was a little of the philosophy of the time, which is bring a lot of eyeballs, and we thought that eventually when people came and started using it, sort of like the ATM example, which is when people start using this, they'll really start to like it versus the alternative, the which frequency is a buck frequency, so you, so you and can, then you as you raise the price, you, it'll be okay. Okay, got it. All right, interesting. But what we learned, and this was by surprise, and it's part of Lean Startup, right, which is instead of doing all the pre-work, we just put it into place and we tested it. And one of the things that we learned is that the utilization of each piece of plastic, the DVD in the red box, was so much higher than it would be at a typical blockbuster that you actually could make money at a dollar. Hmm. And in fact, pretty significant money. So it turned out to be the- You were the guy who actually did make up for it in volume. <laughs> we actually did make up for it in volume. Um, the, the, what was the six month promotional price point turned into a, a nine year promotion. Um, you know, it That's a good promotion. Yeah, yeah, and it worked out rather well. Um, just because it, it worked and we just we were surprised by how quickly people came. And, and the science behind it was basically the moment somebody dropped off a DVD at a red box, it went right back on the, the shelf and then somebody else would come and rent it very quickly. So if you could do it that quickly, you actually can make money at a dollar. Interesting. Fascinating. So we talked about how you nailed it. I always like to say you got to nail it before you scale it. So we talked about how you nailed it. We talked about how the idea came, where it came from. We talked about raising money. Uh, let's talk about scaling. Yeah. So, because um, this business scaled incredibly quickly. So talk a little bit about where was the moment where you said we've nailed it, now we're ready to scale. How did you know? Yeah. And then talk about that process and you know, give us a little feel for how it all rolled out. Yeah, so I was talking before about that first time that we rolled out a full market, which was Denver in 2004. And then the next year in 2005, we rolled out five markets. And the economics of the machines totally overwhelmed us in a positive way. And, and here's what I mean, which is that um, this is just like any investment, right? And, and for, for, for the folks that don't know, a red box costs like ten dollars to $12,000 uh, to put in. And, and we became very religious about, okay, we know what the upfront cost is. What's the cash flow coming off that machine once we put it in? And once we got it to the point where it was pretty predictable, seven, eight, nine thousand dollars $9,000 a year, the question I'd ask anybody is, is would you put up $10,000 to get seven dollars or $8,000 a year back? And the answer is, yeah, I'd do that all day long. And once Great cash. Well, see, no, that's a McDonald's thing, cash on cash returns in restaurants. It's exactly that, yeah. which is, this is what I put up, this is what I get back. Your and four as as it, ROI is four corner ROI. Exactly, yeah. and, it was, and it, was, it was a great, amazing return. And once you feel that that's very predictable and there's lots of other locations that look like that, we turned this corner and then everything was about how fast do you go. And we got to a point where, I think it was 2008 to maybe 2011, we installed one machine every hour, wow. 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So if you do the math, it works out to be about 8,000 locations for three straight years. Wow. So we went from zero in 2001 to what's today about 44,000 machines. What was the hardest part of scaling? 
uh, not making huge mistakes um, that would kill us. Um, so uh, uh, not rolling out so fast so that we were, um, somebody could hack into the credit card system and all of a sudden steal millions of credit cards. N not having the website come down in the midst of all this. So, so how do you scale quickly without blowing it and making a huge mistake that can kill the, you? And how about real estate selection? I mean, is That's a great point. You know, how'd, you, how'd you figure that out? Did you kiss some frogs along the way? Yeah, so um, the, the, that was another key point of this, which was staying incredibly disciplined about what was a good location. So this is retail 101, right? You got to pick the location. But it's not, be... it's not as easy as it looks. I mean, everybody has always held up Starbucks as the best at real estate location. You know, they fly in helicopters. Except for a bunch of years, they did a really right, good well job that, of it. Right, yeah. so for, everybody talks about their state of the art. Every retail rollout I ever heard hired somebody from Starbucks Real Estate Group. And then they closed like 3,000 stores because right. they got it wrong. So we figured out very, very analytically what makes a very good red box location down to the doors at the Walmart, which door works better and which one works worse. And if we're going to have two of them there, so a lot of you might see two red boxes and there's thousands of duels, which is what we call them side by side, getting very scientific about what works. T t yeah. I want, go to that for a second because I think how many of you um, – have read much or have, been, have had any interest in sort of how analytics or big data impact startups and technology. It's great. So one of the challenges of running an analytics software company, I can tell you, is isn't the data you have, it's the data you don't have. Yeah. And so talk a little bit as a startup how you make the decision to, because you've got to create data. I mean, you don't, necess you don't automatically have to know where, which door they're at and the kinds of data around the retail location. You've got to create that. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we a lot of people can just dump these things off and go and say, it's at a target over here. You don't know where it is. You don't know the demographics of the target. You don't know anything about the uh, you know, MSA or what the location is. So you guys obviously made a conscious choice to be very analytical, it we sounds did. like. We did. So talk about making that decision. How hard was it to do, and what were the benefits of it? I think it just started from day one because uh, I'm a data geek. I love I love. The whole big data thing, it wasn't called big data back then, but I loved analytics. So I used to read Bill James' baseball abstracts in the 80s, um, which, you know, of course, became Moneyball um, before it became all that interesting. So I love that, and I always felt like there was an objective answer to a lot of questions. So we ended up taking an approach internally, which is, who cares what my opinion is as CEO or what the other executives' opinions are? If we can get the consumer's opinion really, really quickly, again, another lean startup kind of thing, let's just go do that. So let's say we're arguing about uh, the right place to put a red box is, um, is either outside a jewel or inside a jewel. Um, so I had an opinion on it, uh, but who cares what my opinion but is? Somebody had to go to the trouble to standardize yeah. and create fields for That's all these things. That's what we did. So we, we, early on, we just by ourselves, we said, OK, take 10, 10 red boxes and put them outside at a jewel that looks like a control group for 10 that are inside. Let's look at the results for two months. And then we run with it. And we did that over and over again thousands of times for different experiments. At first, it was just me and my COO and a handful of other people doing this. But we became overwhelmed. So we ended up hiring a guy who was a data analytics guy. And that guy became a group, which was called Strategy Analytics. Today, I think it's 25 people wow. um, that are just doing nothing but analyzing the data that's coming off and setting up experiments to figure out to get to answers. And the thought process is, why go with opinion if you can get the answer really quickly? Right. And, so, it, and it's the right so answer. So what were some of the non-intuitive or non-obvious? Lots of things are intuitive once you know it, of course. Yeah. But what were some of the, um, the not obvious answers that you learned through that work? I thought that, for example, I thought Walgreens location. So today we're at, um, I don't know, four or 5,000 Walgreens. Um, and it's a huge, huge winner. Um, I think it, it, it's, it's probably the biggest location for Redbox. The day that we got Walgreens interested, a lot of us didn't even think that Walgreens would ever work because we couldn't put them indoors and even outdoors. We didn't know if it would be convenient enough. And it turns out it's been an incredible winner. Um, hmm. And that came through. We just said, well, let's, let's test it. It's the biggest drugstore in the world. Let's just go test it and see what happens. Uh, and it turned out to be an amazing winner. And it wasn't that intuitive at the beginning. Interesting. You know, uh, one of the things that those of you doing startups are thinking about this is just to put it in perspective, to do what Greg's talking about means that someone has to not just, you know, as you're busy as can be putting out 8,000 bucks a year, somebody's not just got to get those out, get the, get the contract, get the installation, figure out all the power and everything else you do. But then someone's got to say, okay, what kind of store is this? 
how do I, you know, what kind of zip code am I in? What kind of, where am I inside, am I outside? There's a number of attributes that someone's got to manually basically capture yes. for you to be able to do all this. Yep. That takes incredible discipline. But the flip side of it is once you have 44,000, <laughs> you know, you need somebody to go drive to all those locations or have find that data online for 44,000 locations. It's almost impossible if you don't get it right up front. I, I think it's really important from a leadership perspective, though, that in that situation, the whole company has to know that what we're looking for is the right answer. We're not looking to make individuals look good because they had the right opinion or to justify where they want to go. And if I can contrast this with um, Blockbuster, who basically was our competitor for many, many years and, of course, went out of business and I think candidly did a very lousy job of, as a competitor, we ended up hiring folks from Blockbuster over time. And we'd hear the conversations that was going on there. And years ago, there would be folks in their strategy group saying to top executives, hey, we should pay attention to this Redbox thing. And by the way, they also said we should pay attention to this Netflix thing. Um, and it got ignored. It got ignored over and over again within Blockbuster, which is an interesting case study into itself, which is this huge behemoth that misses the two biggest things that happen in its industry over the course of 10 years. They totally missed it. And I think it was just due to a view which is the top people, a couple of people in the company said, we don't think a Redbox or a Netflix by mail or by kiosk, that can never make money. So they just ignored the data. Interesting. Interesting. Well, Reed, I know Reed Hastings a little bit. He, you know, he advertised where he's going. I mean, he called it Netflix for a reason. I remember meeting him a few years then. I said, why do you call this mail, mail order service Netflix? He said, I'm just trying to get enough customers Right. So that when this moves to streaming, I have an install base because otherwise it only be the incumbents who can do this. Yep. But the name said it all if you want to know where it's going, yep. but it didn't, didn't seem to make a difference. So you spin out, you, have, you, you, you get there, and you got to a billion dollars, which is really incredible. One of the fastest companies in Chicago, I think. Yeah, we, went, we got to a billion in 2009, so it was about seven years to a billion. Wow, fantastic. Which far yeah. exceeded every expectation that we had. We, uh, we thought if we got to 100 million, that would be, we'd be jumping up and down. Um, and then at what point did you sell the company? So right around that time. And, and uh, so Coinstar, who was the then minority shareholder, uh, essentially made an offer to McDonald's uh, to buy the rest of the company. Uh, and that was 2009. And uh, McDonald's accepted. And management didn't, didn't have a, a blocking right. Uh, so that was the sale. And we pushed forward. And uh, I ended up becoming president of Coinstar for the next four years. And when did you uh, retire? <laughs> uh, officially about a year and a half ago, and officially about two years ago, yeah. Got it. So we've got a couple more questions, but I want to take, make sure we take some questions from the audience here. So um, what inspired the name Redbox? What was it like developing brand recognition? Um, you know, yeah. Yeah. So the, uh, the Redbox name, and it wasn't called Redbox for the first year or so, uh, we ended up doing a little bit of work. And at the time, part of one of the conversations that we skipped, one of the other things we were testing was this thing called an automated convenience store, which was exactly what it sounds like. It's like 15 feet wide, and it has 300 different convenience store SKUs. Um, by the way, side story that's somewhat interesting was that the whole thing was refrigerated. Um, they didn't have the technology to make part of it refrigerated, part of not. So uh, one of our first lessons operating this is that um, at 35 degrees, Condoms don't sell really well. Um, uh, toilet paper also doesn't sell very well. Um, but so at the time, we didn't think we were going to be a DVD business. We thought we were going to be automated retail, probably focused on this automated convenience store. So we're all about the box. And we had some uh, firm come in and pitch a bunch of different names. And one of the names that they pitched was, it was C3. It was like convenience cubed. And it was a C to the third on a red cube. We kept on referring to this thing as the, the red box logo. And none of us liked convenience cubed. It was too hard. And we kept on saying red box. And I, there was one, some meeting where I said, well, we keep on calling this thing the red box logo. Why don't we just call that the name of the company and move on? And everybody's like, hey. And that's how, how we got there. And it turned out to be iconic uh, and simple and easy. Uh, so it worked. Interesting, interesting. Um, I know you're no longer with the company, but uh, one question was, how do you think Redbox will compete with Netflix and Amazon in the streaming market? Yeah, so uh, it, to be very, very candid, I, I don't stay that close to following Redbox at this point. I'm, I'm doing different things. Um, so I couldn't tell you today exactly what's going on, but Redbox, um, right at the end of when I was there, created a partnership 
uh, with Verizon called Redbox Instant to try and do streaming. My understanding is it's not going so well. Um, so I think it's going to be really challenging, uh, to be frank. Um, Netflix is way out in front um, with a couple of other competitors like Amazon, and it costs a lot of money to be in that market for, to pay for content. Um, and as a public company, Redbox is, or Coinstar is, is being asked to return cash to shareholders. So I, don't, I wouldn't expect Redbox slash Coinstar to be super active in that market. It's hard. I mean, Amazon, you get a Prime membership, and you get everything shipped for free, and you get all the movies. I mean, it's... It's, uh, it's hard to compete with that. Yeah, very hard to compete. Although a great story is Reed Hastings, you know, uh, the guy who runs HBO, and Reed talked about his distribution. He, he compared Netflix to the Albanian army when he said, are you worried about Redbox? He said, it's like being afraid of the Albanian army. And uh, it's, I, think he's, I think he may be eating his words, but, uh, you know, it's the classic, uh, classic big company move. So how have your business strategies changed from a uh, disruptive startup to when you became an established business facing disruption? When you were, <coughs> did you experience that, or were you always the upstart in the time you were there? I think we tried to behave always like the upstart. Um, and and we, we had this sort of phrase internally, which is we saw what happened to Blockbuster, and we said, let's not get Blockbustered. It became a verb. <laughs> uh, and that means being arrogant and sticking your head in the sand and ignoring stuff that's happening in your own backyard and, and just assuming that because you're bigger, you're going to win. Um, so, you know, that, that, the, that Andy Grove book, which is Only the Paranoid Survive, which I love. Great I, I, title, too. Yeah, it's, I think that's absolutely right, which is you always have to be afraid that somebody is going to come along with some wacky idea that's going to knock you off before you've even realized it. So you better stay close to it and, and just assume that they can be faster than you are now that you're bigger. So that was the approach that we took. Uh, another question on the movie side. How did you convince the movie houses to give you more product after you were restricted from buying first releases from Target and Walmart? <laughs> so um, there's a little bit of context that, that for that story. It may take a minute or two. Sure, Come please. Here. So that question um, gets into a much, much bigger question. So here's the context, which is up until roughly 2008, we bought DVDs through distributors. Uh, because up until that point, none of the studios ever wanted to deal with us, and they also thought that we were always going to go out of business, so why even waste the time? So we had always been trying to get direct deals with the studios. Said we thought it would be cheaper, it would be a great relationship. So 2008, uh, right in the middle of the year, we thought we finally were going to get our first deal, direct deal. Universal was coming to Oak Brook, which is where our headquarters are, and we think, hey, they're coming to give us a direct deal, and my, my COO at the time, said, hey, I think I'm going to get it today. So he comes into my office a couple hours later after they leave, and I said, so did we get the direct deal? And he said, not exactly. <laughs> and I said, what happened? He said, well, it was basically all lawyers, and they dropped something on the table which said, essentially, we're not going to sell to you, we're never going to sell to you, and we're going to force our distributors not to sell to you, which was their way of saying, we're going to do everything we can to put you out of business because we just don't like you. Um, and I said, no, that's not exactly a direct distribution deal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, um, and then I forget the exact timing, but about a month later, Warner Brothers did the same thing, and then Fox followed Warner Brothers. So we had basically half of the studios out there saying, we're not going to sell you product. So what we did was we uh, did a couple of things. One is we sued all of them. Um, <laughs> um, not because we necessarily thought we could win. It was an antitrust suit, and our lawyer said, eh, maybe 50-50. But we just wanted to prevent other studios from coming aboard. Because if all the studios refused to sell to us, we were in pretty bad shape. So that was the first thing. And then we started shopping at, and this is the question, we started shopping at Walmart and Target and Costco and anywhere we can get it. So we, we had 2,000 employees, our folks out in the field, literally going like you and me into a Walmart and coming out with 50 copies of Harry Potter. Um, and, then, and then going back to the U-Haul rent a trailer kind of place and taking them out of those cases, putting them in red box cases, slapping on a bar code, and then putting them into machines. Um, and you might say, well, Greg, that doesn't sound terribly scalable. And we completely agree with you, but we were fighting for our lives, and that was the only option. And copyright law, there's something called first sale doctrine, which said you're actually allowed to do that. You can legally do that, and nobody can prevent you from, from doing that. So this is what we did, and we figured let's do this as long as we possibly can to hold off the studios, and maybe something will change. And what ended up happening is uh, we ended up settling with the studios, and we agreed to lower cost 
direct distribution deals, so we eventually got them about a year later. Um, but we got from those studios, we got them uh, four weeks later, uh, 30 days later, um, than you might have gotten from a Walmart or a Blockbuster. But the great news was that consumers generally didn't notice and they didn't care. So the business just kept on going and we kept on growing. That's great. In the Bezos book, uh, they taught the everything store, they talk about how, I want to say it was, was it Mattel? They came to visit the distribution center, they were trying to get him to do a deal, and they found a bunch of Mattel products <laughs> in the, laying in the distribution center, and the guys are trying to get serial numbers and figure out how did they get these, and you know, of course, they went and uh, bought a bunch of stuff from Toys R bought a bunch of stuff from Toys R Us. And you know, it was the, yeah. the same concept. And the executives kept saying, well, hold on just a second, I just want to see something here. And you know, they're trying to catch everything they can, but it's uh, And the studios thought there's no chance they could buy 100,000 copies of Harry Potter from Walmart. It would take an army of people to do this. And that's actually, internally, that's what it was. It was sort of, it was inspirational to employees in the sense that, hey guys, we're fighting for our lives. It's us against the world. Um, you need to go shop like 24 hours a day over the next two days to get those copies and get them in the and machine. the stores never did anything to stop you. Uh, they, sometimes they would put up signs saying no more than five per transaction. So we had our <laughs> folks going in, buying five, dropping it off in their car, going in again, buying another five all day long. <laughs> um, and they'd go to a different register, you know, because there's 39 registers at Walmart. Um, Again, this is not the way you want to run a business. Um, and at this point, it was a billion dollar business. Uh, but <laughs> tough times require desperate measures. So, so talk for a minute, I'll go to a couple of other questions, but talk for a minute about um, the day that happened and you realized, I mean, you're like, oh, like that must have been, what was it like at Redbox headquarters? What, what was the management meeting like when the, when the lawsuits all dropped on the, you know, the whole thing was, well, that whole thing was unfolding and they told you where it cut you off and all that. You know, it, it actually was, at that point, it was, it was pretty good uh, in the sense that anybody that had been with Redbox at that point for five or six years, and we had a lot of longtime employees right from the beginning, we had already been through about five or six sort of, of our nine lives because we had two different McDonald's CEOs shut us down. We had a machine issue that at one point looked like it was going to kill us. So there were like four or five times that we were on the brink of disaster. And somehow we sort of got through it and kept on going and growing and thriving. Um, and that just creates, um, I think, not, uh, not it, it's a level of sort of quiet confidence, not sort of delusional, like doesn't matter what happens, we're going to be able to make it. But it was sort of, you know what, let's just be calm and, and work together and figure it out. And somehow we're going we're gonna to pull this out. So I, I think that was the thought process. But it, it took five times of almost being dead <laughs> to build that confidence. So uh, another question. How tall is too small um, of market size to attempt to build a startup in? Is there a minimum threshold you look for? Does it vary by vertical? Like, what's, when you think market size and startup, like what's the, how do you think about that? Um, I, I'm, I, I'm hesitating here because I sort of feel like that's like the fifth or sixth question that you should ask about startup. I think, I think it's, does the consumers love the business? Uh, uh, do, do you have a passion for the business? Uh, do you feel like it works and it's profitable? Um, all those kinds of things. And then I, I feel like if all those things are good, um, that's a really, really good green flag to keep going. Yes, if the market size is $4, I suppose that's an issue. But, but we never really, we didn't spend that much time on it. And the reality was we never thought that there was, I mean, by the time Redbox became a $2 billion business, it's basically most of the DVD rental market today. There's just a couple of others around. So nobody ever predicts that they're going to get 100% of a market. Um, you just don't do that, or VCs laugh you, laugh you out of the room. Um, so there was never any expectation that it could get that big. It was just more of, hey, we think that this can work, and consumers seem to love it. So I, I'm avoiding the question, but only because great. I don't get too worked up about market size. Um, so a couple of the audience questions, then we'll ask a couple wrap-ups here. The, uh, can trendy vending machines, like for cupcakes, take any lessons from Redbox, or will they eventually die out? So I actually, uh, I, uh, I, they're talking about the Sprinkles cupcake machine on was at Oak Street. And I, I spent a day, the CEO from Sprinkles asked me to go take a look at it. And I gave him all sorts of feedback, because apparently his machine breaks down all the time. Um, but his economics are through the roof. Apparently, cupcakes are very high margin. <laughs> um, and he's like, well, yeah, it's water and flour. Um, so um, 
we think and thought at Redbox and continue to think that this overall trend of consumers preferring to use machines in place of people, convenience, we think that's a long-term trend, looking out 20, 30, 50 years. Uh, and the psychology of the fact that we don't like talking to other human beings, we'd prefer to do it ourselves, is really fascinating, but it helps drive that whole space. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that there's a lot of promise for these things continuing. And, and I see them sprouting up all the times in weird places like cupcakes. Uh, so I expect that we'll see a lot more of them. Interesting. Um, does Redbox use a suite of algorithms? If so, which ones? Talk about how, how do you use algorithms on picking things? Or, you know, yeah, I would say probably the, we talked before about data and analytics, and there's tons and tons of that going on. I would say the single biggest place that that's done and what has now become a huge model of algorithms is how do you decide how many copies of, again, I'll use the example of Harry Potter, to buy for your 40,000 machines, and then how do you allocate them per machine? Mm -hmm. And it turns out that in our business, that decision is absolutely critical, because if you buy too many, you make no money on that, on that title, um, and, and that happens. And if you buy too few, all of your customers are pissed off because they can't get it. So, where do, you, where do you strike that balance? And did you have a way of capturing, I know one of the things, my first business was an inventory optimization business, and I know one of the challenges when you're out of stock, if you didn't have a way of registering that, you didn't have a sense of what demand you were missing. Did you guys pick up demand? When you, would people be able to request it when um, you were out of stock? We got it, we got it. The answer is no, but there's a way to get it, which is that um, you, can, you can do an algorithm for the amount of minutes that it's out of stock at a kiosk, you can start building curves, and that's what we did, saying this is probably the amount that we should have bought, um, and you can predict it with a high degree of reliability. So over time, we got better and better at better. Oh, right, because they return. Exactly. Got and it. figuring out exactly how many copies of a title to buy, and then even more importantly is how to allocate it, because the Walgreens that might be near your home in Chicago gets a very different amount of copies than the, the uh, call it the Walmart that's in Seattle. Mm -hmm. um, and how you allocate them turns out to be a pretty big deal. Um, Interesting. Of course, that gets entirely screwed up by the other thing that we introduced, which is you can rent from one location and return to another. Um, uh, and it got to, at the beginning, when you have 12 machines, it doesn't happen that much. But when you have 40,000 machines, it got to the point that one out of every two DVDs was being returned to a different machine, hmm. which creates a logistics nightmare. Um, but, uh, and it creates all sorts of complexity now for that formula that I just told you, which is how many copies do you buy, when you know that most of those copies that start there are going to end up over there. Interesting. Very interesting. Well, one more question here, um, which is an interesting one in a very funny way. Why would the bank have hired you over a business person from Harvard? <laughs> um, how how did you get to be the only not how they knew you? I'm to totally to stumped, actually. <laughs> Um, I don't have a really good answer for that. <laughs> somehow I... The snowed, philosopher from Michigan. Yeah, somehow I snowed them into thinking that if you're a philosophy major from Michigan, somehow you knew something about investment banking, yeah, which go. was totally not the case. <laughs> um, but that's a perfectly great question. I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> well, it worked out well for him. The, uh, so uh, we'd like to talk a couple last questions we always do. We'd love to have um, you just kind of run through them quickly. Yeah. Um, we talk, like to always talk, talk about lessons learned. Um, Things that you'd always do again, like, you know, these were great decisions I made. Boy, next company, I'm definitely doing this again. Yeah. Um, there's a handful, and cut me off. Uh, one is, and it's, it's a total cliche, but I'm just going to say it anyway, because everybody says it, um, which is uh, people. It, it is so incredibly critical. Uh, and, and so, as, as I mentioned, this was the first time I had ever run a company. And at the time that I was at Redbox got going, I was 31, um, and you know I had a couple of startups, failed startups in my background, um, and I just I made the call at the time, which um, turned out to be probably the best decision I ever made, which is I'm just going to hire a lot of way more experienced and smarter people than me. Um, so my COO came from Netflix, uh, my head of operations came from FedEx. Um, and people that had far more experience. And there's always this, there's always this insecurity, and I'm going to be honest, which is that, boy, if I hire people that are way smarter and have more experience, um, it'll just highlight the fact that I don't really know what the hell I'm doing. Um, and it, uh, it turned out to be great decisions. Um, and, and we absolutely succeeded because we had such great people, not just in experience and talent, but also just people with great character and integrity. 
uh, that worked so closely together. And there's numerous examples of things that we did to create a great culture and hire the right people. Uh, but I think as CEO, again, when I'm mentoring, I sort of feel like that's, that's half your job is getting in great people. Uh, things you'd never do again. Like, boy, I made this mistake. I learned my lesson. I'm not going to get that wrong again. Um, I think... Uh, I think if I had to go back and do it again, um, I would have uh, I would have raised money um, in 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 pockets. Meaning, uh, uh, I was convinced at the time that we needed 25 to 30 million, and it narrowed our list down to basically one. Um, and and if I had to go, go back and do it again, I probably would have um, raised it in smaller chunks and said, you know what, I just have to have confidence in the business, and we'll see it through. Now, it's hard to know exactly if that was the right or wrong decision, right? Because it, it did turn out relatively well. But it had pretty important ramifications later on. So that's, that's one thing I'd definitely change. Interesting. Um, I know you and I worked together here at 1871 on the exec committee. I think, uh, you know, we're a number of different things. Um, talk a little bit about uh, your view on Chicago for entrepreneurs today versus where it's been and, and yeah. doing a startup here. I, I think it's, it's, it's probably the best it's ever been. I've been in Chicago for 15 years, and one of the things that we skipped as I was working at, the, the second startup was Divine Interventures, which some folks might remember, which was, at the time, was heralded as the big internet incubator for Chicago, got lots of press and lots of money, and, and had sort of an 1871-like vision in a for-profit kind of way. You, remember, you might remember Goose Island was going to be sort of the, mm -hmm. the space, and... Um, and then it didn't happen, right? Uh, market crashed, divine crashed, and then there was sort of a bit of a lull. And I think it has come back roaring in the sense that you have this here and you have a lot of shared office spaces with, uh, around the city. Um, you've got tons of startups, you've got tons of mentors, and now a, bunch, a, a ton of success stories mm -hmm. uh, around. You've got more and more capital. So I think, I think this is the best time, at least since I've been here, to be an entrepreneur in Chicago. I think it's great. Are there companies you work with that you're excited about you might want to share a little bit about? I've been on the board uh, of a startup for about three or four years now, uh, and an investor as well called uh, In Context Solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, for folks that don't know it, it's, uh, I think it's an amazing technology. Uh, they have 3D technology that replicates walking inside of a supermarket, and they sell these services to the Procter & Gamble's of the world that want to test. This goes back to big data, right? That want to test what something looks like on the shelf, a bottle of water or something like that, and exactly how to optimize it without again, lean startup, without going out and spending millions and millions of dollars and actually putting it on the shelf because it's too expensive to do it. So they use virtual reality environments that look, if you look at them, they look like they're almost perfect. You can't tell the difference between a real store and, cool. and their virtual store, which oh, is cool. pretty amazing. So a cool company. Incredible. Yeah, really cool. And they're, uh, they're in a night. They just raised uh, $12 million about uh, two or three weeks ago. Fantastic. And uh, finally, I know you and I have been talking offline about... Um, What's next for you? You've been pursuing some things. What, what, what can you share with all of us about yep. the next exciting chapter in the Greg Kaplan? So I took about a year off after, after Redbox slash Coinstar. And for the last bunch of months, I've been trying to uh, go buy a, a retail business, a decent-sized retail business to run and grow. Uh, not specific as to exactly what it was going to be, but it's, it's trying to borrow a lot of the things that we learned at Redbox in terms of unit economics and fast scaling and lean startup and all those kinds of things. So. Um, I have no expectation of repeating Redbox's success. It's way too high of a bar. Um, I don't think lightning is going to strike twice. Um, and I don't want to sort of hold myself up to, I have to get the next company to $2 billion. Um, the goal is to find, back to the market sizing question, good company, consumers like, an ability to scale, and then run with it. Well, I'm sure it'll be a great success. And you, I've learned a lot tonight. I know we all have. Thank you for sharing. Really Thanks. Thanks.